I want to pick up our fifth study tonight in our little journey in Ephesians. And I am going to move a little deeper into chapter one, although we're not going to get out of chapter one. I'm not under any pretense that we're moving quickly. I know that. We have been in this heavenly bank account for a few weeks. We're going to be here at least tonight and next week as we try to see some of the things that are ours in Christ. I do want to take a little bit of a turn tonight in that I want to talk a little bit a little bit more topical, not, not well, that's not the right way to say that because this whole search, search has been topical. What's in the bank account? That's a topic. Um, but a topic that isn't necessarily about what's in our bank account, but the who that is our bank account. The who that is our bank account is Christ. Because we'll, as we've talked about every week in this study, in Him, in Christ, in Him, over and over and over, to the point that it's almost like Paul's on repeat sometimes, like he's forgotten what else to say, that every sentence just about, he goes back, circles back to in him, in Christ. And it's not a reset for Paul. It's not a tick. It's not like, uh, or saying the word like in between things. You don't know what to say next. Although he writes it in a way that it's almost like his like or his, uh, what a good, uh, to have for it to be in Christ. But he, he throws it in so much that he's, it, he can't help but think that it's either the foremost thought on his mind, which I think is true, or it's just the thing that he wants to drill into the Ephesian church. I think that's true as well. And to, to have in Christ as the foremost thing on your mind is a special place to be in ministry. It's where the agenda is gone. It's just about Jesus. You're not building something. You're not growing something. You're not doing things. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And I know you and I know those watching and listening that our true desire in this journey is to know more about who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. And if we can get a little closer to that tonight, that's a big, big win. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 as we do a lesson called All Things in Christ. And the reason I say it's a little bit of a left turn is because this is not necessarily what's in my bank account. Righteousness, redemption, forgiveness, adoption, inheritance, all that good stuff we've been working on. We'll do some more. This is who is my bank account, not what is my bank account. Because what I have in Christ is really that I have Christ. We can talk all the time about what is mine, what is mine. But the reality is, is who is mine? And as we head into the Christmas season, it's the idea of the arrival of Jesus on the earth. And we're looking at that through a historic lens. We're looking back going, he founded the church and I am what I am because Jesus came. But... Let's, let's not just keep him in the past. I'm not, I'm not talking about the historical Jesus tonight. I'm talking about the ever-present reality, the, the resurrected Christ. That is yours. And what does that mean, not just for me, but for the earth around me? I want to expand you a little bit tonight. I want to stretch your mind a little bit tonight. I also want to tell you before we read that I'm going to take you back to a text we've worked on many times. And I want to give you another way to look at it. And that doesn't mean we're going to kick out the other way to look at it. It just means I want to give you another thing to think about so that you can move the fences a little bit, move the boundaries of what you think a text might mean and say, what if it's saying this as well? And that's a good journey. And I don't, I don't want to give you the answer because I don't have it. It wouldn't matter anyway, but I want it to be something that you can talk to him about. And that is, what are the boundaries of what it means to be in Christ? If our title, All Things in Christ, where you, you know me, I'm pulling this directly from the text. All Things in Christ, what's that mean? And you might have a snap answer, what it means. If someone were to say to you, what does the Bible mean when it says all things in Christ? Um, reserve your snap answer and, and let's work on it together. Um, instead, think about what it might mean. What might it mean that in the end, it's all going to be in Christ? And what would it mean if all things were in Christ? If all's in Christ, what would be left outside of Him? And what would it look like to be left outside of Him? So, Ephesians 1, 7, 8, 9, 10. I'm going to start with four verses. We're going to work out of them and back into 10. 10 is going to be our real sort of center pole tonight, but let's start with this pretext. In Him, and I know we've done this, but I've got to read in. In Him we have redemption through His blood, forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made bound toward us, and all wisdom and prudence. We've been here. We've dealt with this. I hope you've been sort of marinating on the idea of your redemption, what that means, what, what, what it doesn't mean, your forgiveness. I hope you're overwhelmed by forgiveness. I hope you're impressed by forgiveness. I hope you are still trying to comprehend how forgiven you are. Good. Don't ever wear that out. It's, uh, it's worth staying in awe over. 
I am that forgiven, I, th I think. Nine, having made known to us the mystery of his will. He doesn't make known every mystery, but he's making it known. Some things are mysteries, but he's making them known to us and he's doing according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. And here's the real point tonight. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things, there's our title, all things in Christ. What does Paul think that is? Both the stuff that's in the heaven and both that which is on earth in him and knowing how Paul writes, I would say this, based on how you know Paul writes to the Corinthian church, that he could gather together in one all things in Christ, both the things that are unseen and the things that are seen. Or it might sound like this, both the things that are eternal and the things that are temporal. Or to use more Pauline language, both the things that are celestial and the things that are terrestrial. Both the stuff that's up there and the stuff that's down here, the stuff that's out there. Okay, we can keep this going all night because that's kind of the way Paul has set this up. Just given us opposites, heaven and earth. All things there, all things here. And then closes with that phrase, in him, again, which is interesting because Paul's opening phrase after phrase with in him, in him, in him, in him. And he closes one, in him, so that all things are in Christ, both things in the heavens, both things on the earth, and that they are in him. Dispensational theology loves Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. One of the favorite verses of dispensational theology is Ephesians 1, 10, for the reason that they, it's taught that Paul is presenting the gospel as existing in different epochs, different periods of time on the timeline of man's history, that God deals with us in this dispensation this way, and then something happens here, and now God deals maybe this long with man this way, and then something happens here, and God deals. And this, the happenings in dispensational theology is that God either cuts covenant or intervenes. One of those interventions in is Jesus, and that when he declares it is finished, I'm, I'm just giving you a little taste of dispensational theology. I'm, I'm not trying to give you a master course on it, but basic smattering would say that God is dealing in those different epochs and that, and that we're currently in one that won't last forever and that this one will end. And most people then have dispensational eschatology. Now you attach eschatology onto the back of dispensationalism. Dispensational eschatology then is God's dealing in different epochs in different ways and sometimes differently with different people groups because he's dealing with Israel different than he's dealing with the rest of the world, at least that's dispensational theology. And that dispensational eschatology then is that eschatologically there'll be an end of this dispensation and the beginning of another by which God will deal differently with the world then than he will now. And you can try to bolster that up with verses and believe me, I've been there and many are, and you can work against it with verses. Believe you me, I've been there and probably am um, because I don't adhere to the idea that, I, that God is changing his way that he deals in different sections of history. I believe, and I wrote about this a little bit in Greater Than Jonah, I believe there's a river of God's love that starts at the beginning of the word and it flows all the way through it and that man's role in the word is to get in that river. And everywhere he gets in the river, he gets in the flow of God's heart. And everywhere he has, the farther he gets away from the river, the more in a desert he becomes because he's missing out on the heart of God. And the farther into the desert he, he goes, the more he misinterprets the God of the river. And that here comes Jesus going, I am the river. Eternal life flows out of me. And you start with a river going out of the garden and you end up with a river in Revelation. And the whole Bible is this meandering journey of God's love and we're supposed to get involved. Jump in, swim, waters to swim in, a river that cannot be crossed over. I don't believe that in John, when Jesus says it is finished, he means dad's done doing it this way, now we're gonna do it another way. But no, I believe it, it is finished I have done the work that needs done to overcome sin, death, and the devil, and the kingdom of God is upon you. Now go live it. And I don't believe we're in a kingdom that's ever going to end. I do believe we're in a kingdom that expands, 
that Christ isn't finished expanding his kingdom, but he is finished laying the foundations of it. He has done the work to build the kingdom of God and he has conquered sin and the enemy. And that we, when we dealt with our series on the cross, we landed on Christ as, give, as the ultimate victor. Something I wish I had said in that series, I'll say it now. I think anything else in which any other interpretation of the cross that doesn't have Christ winning a battle runs the risk of making you the star of the story. And that's its fatal flaw. So a version of the cross that goes, Jesus died for you. If you were the only person in the world, he'd have done it for you. While that sounds loving and it might not even be theologically wrong, it runs the dangerous risk of making you the star of the Calvary story. You are not the star of the Calvary story. Jesus is the star. Jesus dies as the victim of the empires and nations and kingdoms of this world, but then conquers them by coming out of the grave. He's the star. I participate in his stardom. I am the moon to his sun. The moon does not give light. The moon reflects light, the lesser light that rules the night. He is the, the day star. He is the morning star. He is the bright star. He is the thing that shines, that rises. I am not the center. He is the center. And so what does Paul mean then if not, okay, let me pause right. I don't want to say it that way. Scratch that. Isn't it interesting that out of one little verse, we've developed an entire theological system in which God is doing things through epochs of time and then changing the way he does it simply because Paul said in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to gather together all, all in one, all things in Christ. As if Paul means not in this dispensation, but in another dispensation, God's going to deal differently than, than he does now. Maybe, maybe we could let Paul interpret Paul instead of us interpreting Paul. Seems like a it kind of would help to look, maybe see what Paul meant when he said this elsewhere. So it might look like this. Galatians 4.4 4. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. What's this verse mean? And I, and I know it looks like we're, this is aside from where we are, but I'm using this as a parallel. Paul's declaration to the Galatians is that when it was the right time, God put Jesus into the world. Jesus is not an afterthought. Jesus is not an emergency valve. Jesus is not God's reaction. Jesus is planned. The arrival of Christ is on God's clock. It's exactly the way God wants to do it. It is not the end of the way God used to do it, and now God's going to change his mind. I used to do it this way. Now we're going to bring Jesus, we're going to do it another way. No, Jesus is the expression of the love of God. Please understand the reason, we've said this a hundred times and I'm still trying to say it right. The reason the disciples, I think John 14, say to Jesus, just show us the Father, is because the image they had of the Father God did not look like Jesus. And they got that image from their training and their songs and their teaching and even their scriptures. Not because their training and their songs and their teachings and their scriptures were wrong, but because the lens through which we're looking at God is often clouded by our own guilt, shame, ignorance, fear, condemnation, misunderstanding, hurts, pains, and passions. We're the ones putting those lenses on. God is who God is. Never changing. In whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God's not different tomorrow than he is today. He wasn't different yesterday. He's always been God. Jesus is the expression of God put into the earth at the exact moment God wants to. Not because God goes, oh, I'm sick of this law stuff. And not because God goes, well, I tried. <laughs> I mean, I tried for thousands of years, but they're not getting it. So I'll go down there and do it for them. I know that sounds great. We love to preach that way and teach that way like God just kind of went okay forget the wads it all up throws it away jumps in an earth suit comes down cries as a baby grows up dies on the cross goes okay now I'm going to take care of it and it's a pitiful version of God's events because it has God trying failing and then given one last ditch effort like I'll try to go do it for them no in the fullness of time God said now's the right moment and, and in fullness of time, God always planned it that way. It was God's plan. Now, go Ephesians 1.10 then. 
in the dispensation of the fullness of the times. God has it in his mind, not as a moment when he's going to change the way he deals, but God has it in mind that when it is to be, it will be that all things are going to be gathered together in Christ. It's not an afterthought. It's not an emergency release valve. It's how God does this. And God doesn't change. So where God is heading all of time is not to someday shift how he deals. We're on our way, not to a change in the God's approach. We're on our way to God's end game. God's end game is to bring everyone into Christ, not to shift gears and go, okay, well, we tried it for a couple thousand years. Because I taught dispensation, I had, had it taught to me this way. You're in the dispensation of grace. It ain't going to last forever. You only got so much time. Once the dispensation of grace is over with, God's going to take his church out. God's going to remove his Holy Ghost. In that vacuum, people will start slaughtering animals again and rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. And without the Holy Spirit to convict men of their sins, the only thing they'll be able to resort to is the law of Moses. And with the church out of the way, the devil will go crazy. And it'll look like he's going to win. And then when it's just almost hopeless, Jesus will step in. And he will use the weapons of war to absolutely annihilate the enemy. And he will win the victory. And everyone left on the earth will either worship him or burn forever. No choice. That's how God's going to do it. And the reason why I say that that's a dispensational view is because it didn't take long into that story for you to realize that God's going to change the way he deals with man. Right now, it'll save you by grace. But there's going to come a time when you're going to go back to blood sacrifice for a while in order to come into to God. I don't know where that comes from. And then after that's over with, Christ is going to come back and actually pick up missiles and guns and jet fighters and nuclear bombs, all the stuff he tells you to beat into plowshares now, he's going to use them in the future because he's in a dispensation of good God now. Nice God, grace God, gentle God, peace God. But that's getting ready to be over with, people. And the God of wrath and anger is heating up. And he's going to come down here and he's going to go all Rambo all over the devil and he's going to win because that's what God does. And did you notice that it's not the same God that shows up that it was that that cried in the manger? Even though Jesus said, don't you know if you see me? You're looking at my dad. This is what my dad looks like. This is how my dad acts. He doesn't change his mind. We're not going to go all rogue someday and flip out and decide, well, grace didn't work, so let's go slaughter some people. And I don't know if we realize what we're doing to God, what we're doing to the image of Christ by saying if it doesn't work under grace, God's going to win. Because in the end, you know what the best way to actually fight is? The way the devil's doing it. And that's the way God will do it. He'll just do it better. He'll just win. Total victory. Total war. Total annihilation. God wins. Paul is not taking you to a destination of the end of the world in which finally... God gets his way. No, Paul is walking us down the road saying part of our heavenly inheritance is the knowledge that in the world right now, God is bringing time into himself. He's pulling all of time towards him so that the dispensation of the fullness of times, that God's idea of what full time looks like is not where he changes what he does, but where he brings the world into himself. It's been his goal all along. Let me, let me show you how Paul says it in the companion letter. Some people call Colossians sort of a Ephesians knockoff. So much so that it's almost as if he wrote Colossians right after he wrote Ephesians or vice versa. And he just said some of the same things. But look at the first chapter of Colossians. Watch these verses. Chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. That's, that is John 14. Don't you know if you've seen the Father? You've seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does God look like? No man has seen his face and lived. 
but we did behold his glory. Why? Because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what's God look like? Looks like Jesus. Jesus is the image of God. The firstborn over all creation. The firstborn. Pause right there before you read any more. I know we're not in Colossians. Technically, we're in Ephesians. But you need this verse. Jesus is the firstborn of every person. I didn't say that. Paul did. What in the world does that mean? Humanity got a new start at the resurrection. God didn't change the way he dealt with us. God had been bringing all of us to the cross. Paul stands, let me try to. God had been bringing all of us to the cross, all of humanity, fullness of time. Jesus, the invisible image of God, becomes the firstborn of a new creation. Out of that cross, Jesus' stone rolls away. Jesus steps out as the lone man, the first fruits. First fruits, Paul would say, of many brethren. Paul then stands on the other side of that and says, as God keeps pulling time into himself, he's pulling it all through that one creation. The firstborn of a new creation. He's pulling it all through Jesus. So that like a cone, time is running its way into Christ and then out of Christ. I hope I'm saying that right. I, I see it. I don't know if I articulate it properly. God pulls it all into Jesus, recreates it all in Christ, and then as time runs out from the, from the resurrection, it's all running headlong towards God who is bringing all of it in through Christ. By Him, everything was created that is in heaven. Here's that heaven and earth contrast. Everything in the invisible and everything in the visible. Everything in the terrestrial and everything in the celestial. Everything here, everything there. Everything mortal, everything immortal. Whether it's a throne or it's a dominion or it's a principality or it's a power. It's all by Him. All of it created through Him. All of it created for Him. He is before all things. And in him, all things consist. Give me that Greek word, consist. Synestimi. To put together, to unite parts into one whole. To take apart here, and to take apart from here, and to take apart from here, and to slide them all in and recreate them until they become one thing. On a hand. Part, 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 part whole. There's even a, a bit of an image of grip in this. That which is, one translator says, that which is held together. Notice the hand. You take all of those parts and you hold them together. And Paul, so go, go into that next one, Ephesians 1.10 then again. So God is heading us towards a place in which he gathers in one parts into one in Christ. In Christ, all things come together. So the fullness of God's time is to pull all things through Christ. I've talked to you a lot about John. We did a whole three years on John. I've probably bounced back into John 15 times in other sermons since then. I want to take you again to one of my favorite moments in John. And I want to present it through the lens that I've presented it to you before. And I want to lay it out in a way I haven't laid it out to you before. Not to try to convince you one way or the other, but to get you to think the way maybe Paul was thinking. Maybe. John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Jesus is talking and says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now... The ruler of this world will be cast out. We've talked about a now judgment. Jesus doesn't say someday the judgment. He says now the judgment. This is one of the more important verses in regards to the cross. Jesus is going to the cross to do something. Now I'm going to take care of this business. The world's going to get their judgment. The ruler of the world's going to get their judgment. And then the most famous, maybe, of this passage is 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Your old King James says... 
and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Okay. And what I've pointed out to you many times is that the word peoples or the word men, depending on your translation, is an italics. It's not in the translation. It's not in the Greek, but it's been added. It's been put in there in English so that it can try and give an article try and give title to an art article so that the reader can understand what it is that Jesus is drawing. Okay, and so we've added the word peoples or we've added the word men and I've had you remove it, sort of put your hand over it before because it's not there in the Greek. So without it, it reads, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. And what I've had you to do many times is try to then imagine what might he be drawing to himself if you were to remove the word that wasn't there in the first place. And so you remove the word peoples, and what you're left with is the judgment of the world is about to happen. The ruler of the world is about to be cast out. If I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all to myself. And so he's either going to draw all the judgment or he's going to draw the ruler, which doesn't make a lot of sense because that's in the singular. So, he's, so how I've presented this to you is that Jesus says there's a judgment about to happen if I'm lifted up. And that corresponds with John 3, where Jesus tells Nicodemus, as the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw the judgment into me. So whatever was going to strike, strikes into Jesus. He carries our sin so that our sin can strike there. Okay. Love it. What if you took the alternate Greek for the word draw? because the word has two meanings in the Greek. There's draw, which is to be enticed, to be brought sort of from the inside. Like someone's appealing to your insides. You're being wooed in a way. Like I'm drawing that judgment. But the other way it can be translated is like throwing a net into the sea and dragging the fish to the boat. And therefore, there are some translations that say, when I am lifted up, I will drag all unto myself. And since we've added the word by which we're trying to identify what it is Jesus is dragging, what if he says, now is the judgment of this world, and now is the ruler of the world cast out, and I, if I am lifted up, I will drag all people to myself. And if that's the case, then when Paul in Ephesians 1 says, in the dispensations of the fullness of the times, God is bringing all things into Christ. Splash a little Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 in there. And in Christ all things consist then what if Jesus is saying, I'm about to go be lifted up to be judged and the end game is that I'm going to drag everybody in with me. And that sounds a little bit like Paul's idea of what's happening in Christ in the fullness of the times. Not at the end of the world, but as we come to Christ, as Christ brings it all into himself, there's a dragging going on. When we say drag, we sometimes think dead weight. <laughs> Maybe against their will, people are being dragged in. I don't know how you view it, but think of it in terms that Christ reaches out to grab the ungrabbable <laughs> and pulls them. And that the fullness of times in God's economy is to drag into himself whatever he can drag into himself. Perhaps. Present this idea to you that for Paul, all things in Christ may not just be a statement of all things in Christ, but all in Christ. All that is visible, all that is invisible, all that is in the heavens, all that is on the earth. The parts making up the whole. Christ being lifted up drags all, sweeps the field into himself. And that if it hasn't been, I present this as a possibility. 
it isn't the end if everything hasn't been dragged into Jesus. And if everything is dragged into Jesus, then it's the end. Or are we at the end? You're not at the end until everything is dragged into Jesus or drawn into Jesus. Now, inevitably, we bring to the table, every time you go this far with what Jesus does, you bring to the table, what does that mean for people's response to that? And I believe that people need to meet it with a response in order to access the realities of the eternal while they are here. I think very much I want to continue to tell people about Jesus because I truly believe you get to inhabit and experience the life of the eternal while you're on the earth. I don't mean living forever in the natural realm. You're going to die. You know, newsflash, you're not going to make it forever. But since you get one go around at this and then face your eternity, what if you could tap into the life of the eternal while you're here? That seems to be what Jesus came to show you how to do, is to say, hey, I'm here to show you what dad's realm looks like. Here's how we do things. Remember I told you this a few weeks ago. Jesus comes to say, here's how we do things where I come from. It doesn't look like you're used to. It's not the way you do things where you come from, but I'm going to show you how we do things where I come from. And if you would implement into this world the way that we do things where I come from, what a transformation it might have on this world. That's Jesus' kingdom of heaven is like meal, you know, like yeast in bread, and the whole loaf explodes just a little bit. But what a difference it makes. It's a little seed that grows into a big branch that gives shelter to the fowls of the earth. What great things might happen if we were to implement into the world the life of God. And it's in part, I know sometimes what we're arguing about is terminology. Um, what does salvation mean? What does eternity mean? And, and I know we can get into the weeds trying to parse those things out. At the end of the day, the star figure in the story is Jesus. And what Jesus does at Calvary is not change the way that God deals with man, but introduce man to the way his father had always been and defeat the powers of darkness at Calvary so that he can come out of the grave and continue the work of his father in a new creation reality. And Paul believed, now you can call him crazy, but Paul believed in Ephesians chapter 1 that the end game for him, for God, was that in the fullness of the times he would gather together in one everything. Now what does that look like? Okay, now that you can sit and fight about. But you gotta hate Paul and reject him to reject this idea that at the fullness of God's times, whatever that means, everything ends up in Jesus. Or Paul's a psycho. At the fullness of God's times, everything ends up in Jesus. Everything consists in Christ. Christ is the last one standing. And if Paul's right, then maybe Jesus is dragging all to himself. A couple more verses from this little pocket of stuff here in Ephesians 1, and then we're going to do a little application and call it. This is all we'll do on 11 and 12, and then next week we're going to close out this bank account with the next couple of verses. So for tonight, in Christ also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. I could do lessons on an inheritance, but the reality is, is the inheritance is something that you unpack as you walk this journey out. What it means to you today isn't what it's going to mean to you tomorrow. It's part of the beauty of being saved is to get to figure out what the promises of God are for you in Christ. So it's part of your glory to unpack your inheritance. But we know that we have all of this in Christ and that it's Christ's will that it happened, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. And so Paul speaking by and large to Ephesians as the church, those who first trusted in Christ to the praise of Christ's glory. Next week we will talk about being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And I want to get into what that seal might mean and what that uh, what that means in the greater spectrum of the Scripture. Let's do a little application from Ephesians 4. I've tried to take the front half of the book and slide it over into the back half of the book every week so that you leave with the idea that whatever you learn tonight in the front half of the book has an applicable moment in the back half. That's how Paul writes all of his letters, by the way. We're just trying to emphasize it in Ephesians, unlike we have um, elsewhere, because this is our first Pauline epistle together. 
So I chose, and you could choose other parts, but I chose two verses, and they're parenthetical. Uh, at least, uh, what that means is not just that they're in parentheses, that's parenthetical, but it also means that there's way more than meets the eye, because all we're doing is talking about the parentheses. So I know there's a lot more to this than what I'm going to give you, but I will simply give you the, parent, the parenthetical passage from Ephesians 4, 9, and 10. He ascended. He ascended, quotes. What does it mean but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He, de- he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Paul's application of what he told him in chapter 1 might, sound, might be something like this. We know our Jesus has ascended. What we might not know is that our Jesus first descended because what went up. We like to say, what goes up must come down. But in Paul's theology, what went up had to first go down because there's a descent that precedes the ascent. There's into hell to precede into heaven. And so Paul goes, he descended for what reason? And it, whatever you think that means. Did he go down into hell? Did he go down in harrow hell? Did he go down and suffer hell? Did it just mean he came down from the heavens to the earth? Whatever you think it means, Paul lands on this. He did it so that he might fill all things. So the Jesus that went down so that he could go up did it for the simple reason that he wanted to fill everything with his presence. The Jesus, I think this is cool. The Jesus that dies at Calvary doesn't just lay there and then get to the third day and then get up. The Jesus that dies at Calvary goes into the darkest regions of the realm of the spirit, whatever that means, so that they get a taste of it too. Because God's not going to leave any stone left unturned. He's going to go fill all things. David prophesied that, said, if I make my bed in hell, he said, you'll be there. So Jesus dies at Calvary and goes, you bet I will. Wherever you go, I go. I do it to fill all things with myself. And then he comes out as the first of a new creation. And from that moment on, he's dragging it all behind him. And we're in there somewhere. We're in that dragnet. I leave it up to him what he does with the net when he gets it home. You might say, yeah, but not everybody's going to get it. Okay. It's his net. It's his net. I leave it up to him, but he's dragging that net home. Let him bring the net. All things in Christ. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. Isn't it your hope? It's my hope that at the end, all things are in Christ. It's what Paul believed. I'm going to choose to believe it with him because it sounds like our Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. That's all I know to say. Thank you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for this night. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for the truth that all things are in Christ. I'm not entirely sure what it means, but I really like it. And Father, I pray for a revelation of what it means. May I get to spend the rest of my life on this earth, however long or short that might be, beholding the wonder of what it might mean for all things to be in Christ. And I know that when I get home, I get to see it, at least what it looks like from the other side. We're all going there. My prayer, Father, is that as you drag this net all into yourself, you let us partake a little bit in the glory of that revelation. In Jesus' name, amen.